Hi, this is Dick Meehan, and in the next few minutes I'm going to show you a short video showing the results of a study I made at the end of October 2012 of the fracking issue in the Inglewood oil field. This is a very rough cut, but it'll give you some of uh, at least my preliminary ideas based on my experience working in the Inglewood for now some uh, maybe 40 years now. Okay, let's begin by finding out where we are. We are in Southern California, USA. We're in Los Angeles. And this is a view of the Baldwin Hills area, which is famous for the TV series about the folks who live there, but also well known for the spectacular failure of a dam, the Baldwin Hills Reservoir which occurred in 1963. There goes a large chunk of the inner cement here in the Baldwin Hills Reservoir. That hole is 50 feet across. For the first time in American history, aerial pictures of a disaster were being broadcast live on television. famous failure occurred in 1963 and a few years later my partner Doug Hamilton and I did some investigation of why the reservoir failed and we related that to the oil field operations in the Inglewood oil field. These were published with peer review in 1971 and after that were extensively reviewed by many other people with general concurrence with our findings. And in order to understand a bit about uh, the Baldwin Hills, uh, we can start with this Google uh, shot of the terrain, and then we can use one of the illustrations in our paper about the reservoir failure to show a cross-section of the underground here. And based on all of that, in the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to show you uh, why the Baldwin Hills Reservoir failed. Returning to that Google view, I'm um, drawing a couple of red circles. One of them is where the Baldwin Hills Dam was, and the other one, the closer one on the right, is the Windsor School area, which is outside of the oil field and which is having some similar problems. And in this video, we're going to dissect the Baldwin Hills and take a look at what goes on underground there using the work that I showed you previously that we did back in the 70s. First let's jump ahead and see how things look out there today. We can return to that same spot via Google and I've marked in uh, orange there that alignment of cracks and now we'll helicopter off a bit and the action has now moved. We'll see I'm putting the uh, the satellite uh, imagery on. The action has moved away from the reservoir to the south. That's where most of the production and injection is occurring now, about a mile to the south. And the blue is down about three inches and the red is uh, up. Now let's uh, uh, fly down and take a look at the well-known school cracks, which any school child uh, should be able to both observe and um, measure. They've been there for many years and they're currently uh, quite um, active. Clearly related to oil production and waste disposal, although this is either denied or the subject simply avoided by PXP and its consultants. If we go to Overhill Drive, which is just a few hundred feet away, even on Google Earth, I can see the cracks on the ground, but if you get out and take a, a photograph of them as the early uh, 2012, they're quite visible and uh, quite noticeable to any driver who drives along there. By the way, some time ago when the county asked for suggestions, I suggested that they survey this crack, and I got the completely implausible answer that this was not possible. I don't think this came from the county. I think it came from someplace else. Now we back off again and I'm putting in that orange zone which is the general zone of damage that occurs and we see it extends all the way down 
through the Windsor Hills to at least uh, uh, the Gless residence at the end of the road there. Okay, to return to the point of this whole thing, uh, we are interested in determining whether or not this damage has anything to do with oil field production or the controversial issue of fracking. Okay, let's take a look at this uh, little picture of the Baldwin Hills taken from Google. And we can see these are the Baldwin Hills and this is the ridge line. And behind the Baldwin Hills we have Culver City, that dark area, and then Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles over to the right here. The ho famous Hollywood sign here, the Ross gas explosion was somewhere around here. Back here the San Gabriel Mountains and behind the San Fernando Valley. Alright, geologic features uh, include the Newport Inglewood Fault here. And notice this this graben, this, this uh, depressed area. That's what the geologists call a graben and long-term geologic processes have caused that to sink down. The Baldwin Hills Reservoir was back up here and it sits on a branch fault of the new Port Englewood Fault. There are several of those branch faults. They come like this. And over here, a little closer, is the Windsor School area. And it also sits on a branch fault that is uh, analogous to the branch fault that the reservoir sits on. The Newport Englewood Fault, I'll draw it below ground here, down to a depth of around 3,000 feet. The branch faults come down something like this. And eventually join the Newport Englewood Fault at depth. And trapped between these faults are oil sands that look something like this. And these are sands in which oil has accumulated over a long geologic period of time. And if you want to recover this oil, you can drill wells down from the surface of the ground like this and tap that oil. And if you do that, eventually you will cause the volume down here to be reduced because the fluid has been taken away and that will cause subsidence. And up to 20 feet of subsidence uh, actually occurred from the 1920s until the 1950s because of withdrawal of oil from down at these depths. This is down at around 2,000 feet or deeper. Now, Starting in the 1950s, uh, for various reasons, they decided to take the excess salt water that comes out with the oil and to re-inject that down into the ground, something like this. And that both restores the pressure in the oil sands and increases the amount of water that flows to the wells and it also uh, reduces or ideally eliminates the subsidence. However, as you can imagine, they cannot inject the oil exactly back into the same place where they got it. So you don't have a perfect elimination of subsidence. You get some areas that still go down, some that go up a little bit, uh, because you can't match that. These are broken into compartments uh, down at this depth. And in addition, by injecting uh, water into the ground, you raise the water pressure on these faults. And when you raise water pressure on faults, if there's a tendency for them to move, uh, they will move something like this. Now, in the hydrofracking operation that they did in this same area, very similar to the injection walls, uh, wells, they injected water under even higher pressure uh, down in the vicinity of these faults and that would have exactly the same effect as we found that injection did back in the 1960s that caused movement of this fault and failure of the Baldwin Hills Reservoir. 
It also caused movement on the fault down at Stalker LeBray down here, the one that goes through the Windsor School, and that's exactly what is happening again today. Okay, what do we get uh, when we have these fault offsets uh, on the top of the ground? We get something like this. The ground is like this. The fault comes up and the ground gets offset. This may be, oh, two inches, three inches, four inches, depending on how much the fault moves. Uh, any building sitting on top of that is going to become distressed or damaged, something like that. And uh, what else can happen is that this fault is a, a fractured zone and there's a methane gas down here at depth and this can become a conduit for the methane gas to come up and reach the ground surface and this is exactly what happened at the Ross store explosion uh, a few miles north of here back some years ago. And here's the way things end up on the ground surface, Baldwin Hills, 1963, about four inches of uh, offset, and today, uh, 2012, in the Windsor School area, very similar effect. So what do we have here at the, at the end of the day? We have a, a company that uh, you, you think could address this problem uh, uh, in an open way. Um, you know, it may be that what they're doing out there, they're doing a really great job of trying to balance uh, uh, injection, uh, production, uh, and hydrofracking in a way to minimize damage. And there is not a huge amount of damage occurring uh, next to the field. So you might say they're doing uh, perhaps a, a good job. But they're not doing a perfect job and there is damage occurring. And the part that I find troubling is the fact that they are just seem to be unwilling to 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 admit that, and that they uh, why do they go to these great lengths to hire all of these consultants and and manipulate uh, everyone in this and the way and that way and, uh, in such a way as to try to make themselves look blameless? It just doesn't make sense to me. They could sit down with these people and resolve the issues. Uh, they could make some agreement with the people who are being damaged, and I, I know that, that there are people being damaged, uh, and uh, come up with solutions to the problem. But for some reason, they just don't seem to have the culture that is willing to do that. You tell me why.